Hello everyone, welcome back. I got some really good ones for you today on this Friday, March 3rd, 2023. A lot's been going on inside the markets, economy, geopolitics, so let's dive right into it, shall we? Markets, the three major US stock indices all had a pretty monster day today. Same for gold, same for oil. Cryptos uh, fell under a little bit of pressure, but we'll discuss that. Essentially, over the last week and a half or so, risk assets like the stock market, oil, gold, Bitcoin, they've been under pressure because the 10-year yield has been rising from about 3.5% up to 4%. And as those yields rise, interest rates rise, the dollar rises, the you know mortgage rates rise, the cost basically to service debt rises, and that pushes downward pressure on risk assets. That 10-year yield hit like 4% yesterday. That was pretty freaky, putting those 30-year mortgages just over 7%. So, you know, we've talked a lot in these uh, videos how 7% is kind of the danger zone for real estate. As, as soon as mortgage rates go above 7%, you know, that prices so many potential buyers out of being qualified, it starts to just push downward pressure on price tags for homes. I'd say real estate's fallen probably about 15% since the Fed announced its tapering and raising of interest rates in November of 2021. So about a year and a half now, real estate has come down, I would say about 15%. There's a lot of talk that it's gonna you know, keep falling, a lot of fear out there right now. But I think that these mortgage rates can fall below 7% again and start moving down, that's just gonna put upward pressure on home prices. So there's been a little bit of uh, fear in real estate for sure with these rising mortgage rates and you know falling mortgage demand. But we would have to fall another like 15 or 20% just to be where we were in like 2020. So you know since 2020 real estate's had about a 40% run. We've given about about 15%. We'd have to go so much lower in home prices just to be where we were in 2020. And we'd have to go so much higher in mortgage rates in order for us to get there. And I just don't see it. I see 7% as the danger zone for real estate. As soon as mortgage rates break above 7%, things start to get really freaky. And then I kind of look to the Fed to, or somebody to start buying bonds, driving those yields down, driving those rates down, driving that dollar down, driving those mortgage rates back down. And that just pushes those home prices right back up. So, you know, real estate's taken a bit of a, a wallop. The NASDAQ since November of 2021, when the Fed announced their tapering, has taken a bit of a wallop. Gold just kind of doing gold things, being a value store. And then oil has taken a wallop too, because remember in, 2021 gas prices were like pushing five, six, seven, eight dollars a gallon. And they've since come back down a little bit, but I mean, generally speaking, gas is still pretty expensive. This inflation is sticky. Groceries remain pretty expensive. So I guess you could say starting in 2020, when the Fed added 40% of the money supply, inflation kind of became 40%, created all this froth and, um, just, you know, weird price signals. And then the Fed kind of saw, oh my gosh, like we've, we've created a lot of market instability with our uh, 2020 rate policy. And now it's time to kind of rein some of that froth back in, kind of raise those interest rates. Inflation remains a sticky problem. We've been talking about that, you know, but we haven't really discussed like the reason why. And so I guess I'll, we'll go down a little rabbit hole there. How come in, you know, 2008, 9, 10, we had the great financial crisis and then we didn't have the inflation that we're seeing now? Well, it's kind of tricky. When we went into the great financial crisis, the Fed dropped interest rates down to 0%, began printing tons of money, and we did see some inflation, okay, because gold ran to like 1900 back in 2009, silver tested $50 an ounce. So there was some inflation, but it came back down in those years following. I think this business cycle, so from 2020 on, is gonna look a lot more inflated because we have a changing global order and because we never cleaned up our mess 
from the great financial crisis. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we went into the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and we dropped those interest rates down to 0% to kind of stimulate the economy, we forgot to raise them back up again in preparation for the next recession. And when I mean forgot, we didn't forget. It's just that the debt level was already too high to sustain higher interest rates. And so by 2015, you know, seven years after the GFC, the great financial crisis, we need to be, to be back at about a seven and a half. 8% Fed funds rate in order to prepare for the next inevitable recession so that we could cut rates back to zero. The bottom fell out of the dollar because in 2015, they still hadn't raised interest rates back up to a normal level, call it five and a half percent. By 2016, nope. 2017, nope. 2018, 2019. And then we had the pandemic in 2020, so a financial crisis. And the benchmark rate, the Fed funds rate was not back to five and a half, six and a half percent. It had only made it up to about one and a quarter percent. So when we got hit with the virus in 2020, the Fed's first reaction was we need to drop interest rates, but they were dropping them from only 1.25%. That's only 1.25, that's only 125 basis points of stimulation. It's gonna be really hard to stimulate your economy with only 125 basis points of cutting. Basically, interest rates were already way too low going into the 2020 you know, crisis. And then once that crisis hit, the Fed cut rates down to zero and started telling you, we're not even thinking about, thinking about, thinking about, thinking about raising interest rates. And that created a lot of instability in the market because everyone went long. That's why the NASDAQ went straight up during 2020. Everybody was locked down in their homes, all adopting new technology and pumping their stimmy money into like Amazon stock and Google, you know, so we saw this uh, insane, you know, bubble in tech in 2020, 2021 on the heels of like 11 years of keeping interest rates way too low for way too long. So let me put this to you another way. If the virus had hit in 2020 and instead of the Fed cutting interest rates from one and a quarter percent down to zero, they had risen them. Well, they, they, they had risen the interest rate. What would have happened is because everyone was locked down in their homes and there was half as many goods and services in the economy during 2020 and 2021, you could have raised the interest rate, which would have drawn liquidity out of the system. And if you're drawing liquidity out of the system and you only have half as many goods and services in your economy as you normally do, that would have actually kept prices stable. So raising interest rates would have been good for the dollar, you know, and it would have kept inflation from getting completely out of control. But in 2020, they had already derelicted their duty and raising interest rates for that like 11 years prior. So they, they had already refused to clean their room for 11 years straight. And then we go into the pandemic and then we have to what devalue the dollar on the heels of already devaluing the do dollar. So the bottom fell out and the Fed added 40% to the money supply in 2020 and prices need to go up 40%. And, and it's been, you know, stubborn, but we've been slowly getting there, you know, 20% inflation for 2020 you know, 15% for 2021, 15% for 2022. Now we're at like probably 10 or nine, somewhere in there. So it's taken a while to uh, get prices to reflect the 40% that the Fed had added to the money supply in 2020 on the heels of trashing the dollar all those years prior. You know, if we had a Fed funds rate in 2020 of like six and a half percent, the Fed could have cut down to zero and we probably wouldn't have seen that much inflation. But we didn't. We started with a very inflated Fed balance sheet, a very abnormal interest rate policy, and then we ran ourselves into a crisis and then needed to devalue from an already very devalued state. Then we have the whole um, global order changing, right? Like maybe a lot of countries this business cycle, this next 10 years are going to be looking to uh, maybe not hold as many U.S. treasuries on their balance sheet, maybe looking for, for other alternatives. So 
you have the change in global order that has been pretty messy for inflation over the last couple of years you have also the supply chains being broken okay because when you have 40 percent more money chasing 40 percent less goods and services in an economy prices really need to go up to compensate for that you have all this extra money chasing even less goods and services so the price of the those existing goods and services has to go up a lot then we had a situation where the fed since 2020 has been refusing to uh, shrink their balance sheet. It's at about eight and a half trillion right now. It has been coming down every month. If you go look at the Fed balance sheet on like the St. Louis Fed website, you'll see that it was like nine and a half trillion before the taper and now it's like eight and a half trillion. But my point is the Fed balance sheet needs to be like, you know, is close to zero. The closer to zero the Fed balance sheet, the better it is for the economy and that guy out on the street. Basically means that you don't need this central bank like underwriting and backstopping your entire global economy. So the Fed balance sheet remaining really inflated has been inflationary in the money supply, you know, and the broken supply chain. So you just, you kind of add it all up. The broken supply chains, the 40% added to the money supply, the fact that the dollar was already off balance that 11 years prior to the 2020 pandemic. Um, yeah, you have, you have a lot of reasons why you're seeing inflation kind of stick around. We also need to devalue this debt, all right? So if you have a $32 trillion national debt and you have no intention of paying that thing off, well, make the value of it $15 trillion. Make 32 trillion by 15 trillion worth of stuff and you're starting to devalue your debt. It's a dishonest default because instead of saying, hey man, can't have, I'm not gonna pay you, you just start cutting those checks, right? So we've seen a lot of inflation. It's been really sticky. I did have a question from uh, CEB2, what's up? Shout out to CEB2 about the US implementing sanctions against China. What would that do for inflation? Well, the short answer, stoke inflation, and, and in my opinion, make inflation a lot worse. Anytime you have embargoes, tariffs, sanctions, it, it's all pretty much economic war, okay? So the way we have this like global economy set up is all these different countries have their respective comparative advantage, their things that they're good at producing and selling to other countries. And you might have a situation where America looks at China and, you know, gets mad about something, whether it's like a virus leaking out of a lab or like, you know, what they're doing to some of the minority groups in their country, or maybe they're going to, they're floating the idea of sending weapons to their, their, their new friend, the Russians. Well, America sees that and we get mad. So what we do is we step in and say, you know, no more buying, uh, widgets off these people just using widgets as an example no more buying from them they're bad they're making a lot of money selling these widgets to the rest of the world so no more buying from them you will be punished any american company if you buy those widgets you know that would be like a, a full-on embargo like meaning you know i'm not letting anything pass an embargo is like you two no more trading you're not allowed to trade with each other anymore period end of story a tariff is just like, we're gonna slap a tax on that. So let's say we import a bunch of widgets in this example from China, and there's a tariff on it. Well, you, you know, you're gonna have to pay more for those, those imports. Any form of economic war though, reduces um, cooperation amongst countries, reduces, you know, volumes of trade, reduces a country's ability to leverage their com uh, comparative advantage with other countries. So it really is kind of like taking a poison pill. You can look this up. Sanctions only generally work about 33% of the time. So you only have a one in three chance of really, uh, you know, getting what you're looking for when you initiate one. And it really, it hurts you, but you're, you're hoping to hurt them more. So, so although you're disincentivizing American companies from wanting to participate with China, and that hurts those American companies, the idea is you're hurting China even more. So it's a bit like, you know, taking a poison pill, but it's not going to hurt you as much as your, your uh, competitor or your adversary. So 
I'm not a big fan of any, any form of sanctions, whether it be tariffs, embargoes, you know, those generally, those generally don't work. Only a 33% chance that they will. And they're often a precursor to an actual shooting war, okay? So every war kind of begins with, hey, you're, you two aren't allowed to trade with each other anymore. We don't talk to them over there. And then from there, it kind of devolves into, you know, a shooting war potentially. So I don't like any, any kind of embargoes or tariffs or, or sanctions, especially because it just drives up inflation for both parties and um, stymies growth and cooperation and kind of breaks down kind of deglobalizes things a little bit. You know, I'm not like a globalist fanboy or anything, but I do know that there's certain things China's good at doing and there's certain things that America's good at doing. And when you start to throw a wrench in that because you're, you're you know, salty, your government gets salty at China and wants to throw a wrench into y'all's uh, relationship. Well, no, you know, ultimately nobody wins from that. So not a big fan of uh, sanctions, but if, you know, let's say China starts to send weapons to Russia. Well, I would anticipate America gets pretty salty about Russia and China's newfound friendship, and we'll hit China with some sanctions. And we're hoping to do more economic damage to them than they're doing to us. But, you know, net net, sanctions hurt, you know, both parties. It's basically saying y'all aren't allowed to sit next to each other at lunch anymore, you know, kind of thing. So not a big fan of sanctions. Do think it'll stoke inflation. Um, but, you know, I guess an economic sanction would be preferable to an actual shooting war like the one we're seeing right now between uh, Ukraine and Russia and the, the West that's supporting the Ukrainians and the Chinese that could potentially begin to start supporting the Russians. So it is interesting that we see this uh, global axis beginning to form between, you know, Russia and China, you know, we've talked about that though in uh, other videos, so pretty crazy stuff, but yeah, I, I, I would say sanctions are only gonna make inflation worse, especially now that the inflation genie is out of the bottle. So understanding why the inflation is sticky this time kind of requires understanding how from 2008 to 2020, we were being terrible custodians of the dollar doing a terrible job of shrinking the Fed balance sheet, doing a terrible job of getting the interest rate back up to an adequate level for the next recession so that you would have enough um, percentage points to be able to cut to stimulate. You know, so we didn't clean our room. We really needed to get ready for the recession we got hit with in uh, 2020, but our room wasn't clean. Then we had to throw all that missing growth in 2020 onto the back of an already off balance and confused dollar. So poor dollar. Another thing the Fed could do is uh, increase uh, capital reserve requirements for banks to get inflation under control, but we haven't seen that. Have you noticed that none of these people on TV for talking about fighting the inflation fight and getting inflation under control, none of them talk about shrinking the money supply. None of them talk about rolling the Fed balance sheet back down to like a trillion. None of them talk about, um, you know, raising the interest rate above the inflation rate, which is what you'd need to do to, to break the back of inflation. So they, they tell you, oh, there's this problem with inflation. Look, oh my gosh, who's going to save us? But the reality is they, they could do like all of these things to get inflation under control. But they, hey, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the Fed balance sheet getting shrunk back down. We don't talk about raising capital reserve requirements for banks. We don't talk about what poor custer custodians we were for the dollar from 2009 to 2020. We're just going to talk about how these little 25 basis point, 50 basis point rate hikes are going to do something to fix inflation. Have you noticed that? So it's all engineered and by design. The Fed knows exactly what it's doing. And it's kind of to devalue the debt, right? If you have 30, if you have 32 trillion on a credit card and you have no intention of paying that thing off, you sure you sure don't want your interest rates on that 32 trillion to go up. And if you can devalue that 32 trillion, so it's only worth a Toyota Corolla, hey, you're off the hook. You're living it, you're seeing it. So pretty weird stuff, but uh, you know, one more thing and then, and then I'll let you go. Um, valuetainment uh, was talking about real estate. I'm not like a 
what what's the guy's name? Patrick Bet David, I think is his name. The the Value Entertainment guy. He's pretty cool. You can go, you can go on YouTube, Valuetainment, check him out. I'm not like I said, I'm not really a fanboy, but they were doing a uh, discussion about real estate, and you know Patrick said something. The the host, cool dude. He said something about uh, you know when he thinks real estate's gonna bottom and and when he would really want to start doing deals again. And he says when unemployment hits 5%. So let's talk about that because I think he's actually onto something. Right now, the unemployment rate, it's like 3.5%. It's super low, okay? So unemployment is super low. Now, we're excluding people that like have dropped out of the labor force completely. So do understand that these employment numbers that you're hearing, they are fudged. They are a little bit uh, wonky and fake to, to paint a rosier picture. But with that being said, unemployment is at record lows right now. And as the Fed raises those interest rates, you know, they're trying to fix the inflation problem, but they know as they raise interest rates, they kind of crush demand. And they've even kind of telegraphed that they're willing to accept a certain amount of uh, unemployment to come as a result of these interest rate hikes. And so I would say if unemployment is three and a half percent right now, which is a lie, but just put that off to the side. If it's three and a half percent right now, maybe the, the Fed is gonna allow it to rise to about 5%, which will also be a lie, but just go with their numbers. And once they hit 5%, they will have seen adequate falling of demand. You know, they, they feel like they will have gotten the inflation fight as under control as they could, without risking unemployment going up to like six, seven, eight, nine. The Fed does not want unemployment to go too, too high, obviously. That kind of piggybacks on the whole, they don't want to induce a recession, but they do want to get inflation under control. They will continue raising interest rates to do that. So I would say, yeah, if the Fed were willing to allow unemployment to go from three and a half percent up to 5%, I don't think the Fed would allow it to go much higher. And then they would be done, you know, with their quest to solve inflation. And we'd probably be looking at rate cuts in order to prevent unemployment from going up to like six, seven, eight, nine, you know, 10% higher, higher, higher. So I, you know, I think he could be onto something there. Um, if unemployment hits 5%, I think the Fed is definitely gonna throw in the towel on, on their inflation fight and then start to actually cut rates. So, you know, rate cuts might not be that far off. I think we'll have maybe one or two more 25 basis point hikes to the Fed funds rate this year. And then by the, you know, the back half of this year, if unemployment climbs from three and a half percent to call it like four and a half, five percent, that's gonna kind of freak the Fed out and they're gonna stop raising interest rates. And as soon as the Fed, you know, this is like the $100,000 question, as soon as the Fed stops raising interest rates, you know, that's where, gonna, that's where you're gonna wanna get all that cash to work, start making those deals, because as soon as the Fed starts cutting rates, those risk assets are gonna do exactly what they did in 2020, in my opinion, which is to start to inflate. You know, in 2020 or 2021, when Bitcoin was around like 58,000 or whatever, 60,000, that's because the 10 year yield was only 0.65%. So the, the lower bond yields go, the lower interest rates go, the lower the dollar goes, the higher these risk assets go. In the meantime, the Fed's gonna fight inflation, you know, with one hand tied behind their back. And as soon as unemployment hits 5%, they're gonna start cutting again. That'll be the bottom for risk assets and everything should start to inflate again. So uh, yeah, I think, you know, tentatively if, if unemployment hits 5%, that's going to be close to the bottom for risk assets because the Fed's not going to keep raising interest rates past that. And in the meantime, you know, between now and 5% unemployment, the Fed could start cutting at any minute now. And even if they don't cut, they keep raising. As long as the Fed balance sheet continues to inflate, as long as the interest rate isn't above the inflation rate, and as long as the Fed doesn't, you know, raise capital reserve requirements for banks, well, then you're going to keep getting what you're getting, which is just, you know, steady as we go. Six to 12%
you know, eight to 12% per year for the equity markets, eight out of 10 years, you know, that kind of thing. The B system continuing to feed. That's kind of really all I got for you today. Uh, but, you know, we'll, re we'll reconvene as things progress. You know, thanks for joining me today. Like, subscribe, comment, share, whatever. You guys are awesome. You know, if you could hit a like and a sub, that'd really help me out. We're, we're going to keep growing this thing, all right? Till next time.